Hi, I'm Hanna. Uh, can you hear me or should I? I can okay. hear you. Great. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Hanna. And I'm Daniel. I work for Lynx Analytics. Oh, me too. Uh, are we allowed to? <laughs> are we allowed to say more about the company? Um, sure. Um, we are a big data analytics company with a special focus on graphs. We wrote LynxKite, a Spark-based analytics tool for working with huge graphs. Um, Daniel, did, did you ever want to analyze a huge graph? Oh, a huge graph? What sort of graph? Like uh, the phone calls made in a country or mm -hmm. bank transactions? Uh, mm -hmm. Social network? Yeah, I like that. Can I use LynxKite for that? Yep. Sure. Hmm. Uh, and, and what sort of analysis can I do? Uh, like, what if my data set is incomplete? Maybe uh, the age is not known for some profiles. Could I use Linksky to predict those ages? Sure. Uh, this is what this talk is about. Um, Linksky allows you to easily do all sorts of computations on graphs without writing any code. Predicting missing attributes is a very common use case. How would you get started? I mean, if you have not heard this talk yet. Uh, honestly, whenever I need to predict something, I just uh, use machine learning, like my grandma told me. So just, uh, I would just take the existing attributes, train a model on it, and uh, predict the missing attribute. OK. And, and, uh, and how well uh, do you think the other existing attributes, like hometown and gender, will predict the age? Well, let's see. Twenty-five percent. Um, wait, what, what do you mean by twenty-five percent accuracy? All right, all right. Um, I have this little benchmark problem. Uh, we use a, a real social data, a real social network data set to measure the accuracy of different prediction methods at links. Uh, the objective in this uh, challenge is to predict the, the age based on the training set. In the data set, we actually have the age data for all the profiles, but for 15% of the, the profiles, I pretend that the age is not there. And, and this way, we can measure the accuracy of a, a prediction for simplicity and also to allow benchmarking classifiers. Um, we, we bucketed the age uh, into four groups. Uh, the very young, the, the young, the old, and the very old. So, so a random guess would have an accuracy of 25%, just like your machine learning model? Uh, well, yes, yes. Uh, but uh, also, I mean, if my data set included some attributes like the favorite band of the person, that, that would surely help. Uh, I think we can do much better if, uh, if we use the graph data as well. Just. Uh, Look at the file size. Um, well, maybe it's not there, but uh, the, the friendship data is five times larger than the profile data. Um, hmm. So I think we should use that. Uh, OK, OK. Let's use machine learning. Uh, let's use graph metrics then. I, I will just calculate all sorts of graph metrics, like uh, the degree of vertices, the page rank, clustering coefficient, mm -hmm. harmonic centrality. Things Kite can compute those for you. Oh, excellent. And, and then uh, use these as extra features. So this way, I generated more features and uh, <laughs> train a better model now. And it uh, does uh, have 32% accuracy. OK. You picked some metrics with uh, predictive power. But uh, the known attributes in the neighborhood are still ignored. Another ideal is to just uh, take the average age class of the friends for each profile and use that as a prediction. I hate to tell you, but it gives much, much better accuracy. Um, actually, it's 70%. And uh, we can improve it even further if we take the average on a more carefully chosen set of profiles. Uh, for example, we can take the communities the profile belongs to, uh, pick the community with the most homogeneous age, and uh, use the average of this community as a prediction. This leaves the accuracy to 73%. Oh, wow. OK, so, so it looks like, really, neighborhood average looks like a great predictor. 
uh, for, uh, for this prediction problem. I guess the sum of the neighbors or the variance or some other metric could work better for, for some other challenges <coughs> or some other problems. But, but here, I really like neighborhood average. I want to use it in my machine learning model as well. So use it, this, uh, it, use it as uh, yet another feature. And uh, let's see, 75 percent. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, sorry to, to break it to you, but we've developed a new approach that has all the benefits of machine learning, but is also able to consume raw graph data as well, all the vertices, edges, and attributes. And uh, it has an accuracy of 82% uh, of on this benchmark. Oh, no way. That, that is too high. Uh, you must have spent ages picking out uh, the perfect uh, predictors to get that. Nobody has time for that in a real project. Actually, I did not pick any predictors or fine tune anything. I just ran this neural network model on the raw, raw data to get predictions. Oh, but but uh, no predictors at all. We just established earlier that page rank and the, the especially the neighborhood average, they look like uh, very powerful predictors. Why abandon them? Um, look at it this way. Do you know who invented PageRank? Uh, must have been Mr. Page. Yeah, and uh, he did not invent it. Then he did not invent it to support your age prediction problem. The pre-invented metrics we can use with a classical machine learning approach will never, will never be tailored to the data set in question. Our neural network uh, also computes a large set of graph metrics, but these metrics are, are uh, invented by the network when it is learning from the data. So they will be optimal for supporting the predictions. Mm. And uh, how do you do that? Um, we use graph convolutional networks. Oh. All right, I've, I've read that article by uh, Yuji Ali and uh, Richard Zemmel of uh, University of Toronto and Mark Brocksmith and uh, Daniel Tarlow from Microsoft, Microsoft Research. Um, and uh, do you remember what they did exactly? Well, they, they put a recurrent neural network in, in every vertex of the graph. Uh, do you guys know what a re recurrent neural network is? Brief, briefly, uh, they, they are great in situations where uh, the, the length of the input is uh, not known in advance. It has a varying length, like in, in machine translation, where the sentence that you are translating can be longer, longer or shorter. And the recurrent neural network can consume the elements of the input uh, one by one. And uh, as it consumes them, in each step it updates its internal state. Uh, and the model described in, in this article is set up so that uh, instead of an external input, in each step the recurrent neural network uh, takes as its input the, the state of all its neighbors. Uh, in effect, each node starts with a knowledge of its own properties and uh, in each iteration exchanges messages with the, the neighbors for some fixed, fixed number of iterations and uh, after that it out outputs a result. Okay, let me see if I got this straight. Um, I drew a picture. Um, so the the columns here correspond to vertices, boxes are neural networks, and the circles are state vectors. And the uh, time goes from bottom up. Um, at first, uh, each vertex, so, so each uh, vertex has uh, um, the labels, so the age if it is known, and uh, any other profile attributes we want <laughs> to use as features. Um, then the state goes along the edges. The central vertex here is connected to the left and right vertices. And uh, after a fixed number of iterations, the state, vector, uh, the state vectors contain the predictions. Um, here I drew two iterations to, to fit on the page. Right, and, and uh, all those Ws, it's, it means that it's the, the same matrix is used everywhere. Ah, yeah. Right? And, uh, and is this working? Oh yeah, yeah. In this article, they report uh, some really fantastic results. Like uh, they report 100% accuracy on uh, 
finding shortest paths and uh, finding Euler circuit uh, challenges. And, and these are really hard problems. They, they also quote some baseline results from uh, other approaches where the accuracy is 10% for shortest pass and 1% for Eulerian circuit. Uh, so it's fantastic, but I, I cannot imagine how to apply this, uh, this same method to my data set. Like, uh, uh, they trained their uh, network on many, many small graphs and then gave prediction and gave a prediction on another small graph. So the input elements were small graphs, and then the, the prediction problem is, is also a small graph. But uh, I, I only have a single graph, and it's huge. Right. Let's uh, tackle those two problems one at a time. Um, first off, we need to train and predict on a single graph. A neural network or or any classical machine learning model is trained by showing it many examples where the answer is already known. If we can measure how good each answer is, we can encourage correct answers and discourage incorrect answers. Um, the authors of the article you described had many example graphs for training, which we do not have. We have many, we have many profiles, though. Can, can we use those? Um, yeah, sure, we have no choice, so indeed we have to use the profiles. Um, the problem is the, the network acts on the whole graph as, as a whole. We, we, we cannot simply cut it up into smaller graphs because that would destroy the patterns we wanted to learn. Um, we, um, we measure the, the but, but we can measure the error only for the, the, ver the vertices where the age is already known. Um, what do you think will happen if we allow the model to use the known ages as its input? Uh, so we, as the input, it gets the known ages, it uh, calculates a prediction, and then uh, we compare the prediction to the known ages, which it got at, as the input. Yep. So I bet it will just learn to copy its input to its output, because that uh, gives it zero error. So. Uh, so I, I guess this means that, that we cannot give it the, the known ages as the input. But, but the known ages are extremely valuable input. Remember uh, how well the simple neighborhood average model did. It would be a shame to ignore this data. Would we find a compromise? Hmm. So it, it's bad if the network uh, sees all the, all the known ages. And it's bad if the network sees none of the known ages. Well, let the network see some of the known ages. Turns out this works well. Uh, we can, in each iteration, we can split the training set into two parts, let the network see the ages of one part, and uh, train the network based on its answers for the other part. With this, we have now solved one of the issues regarding applying graph convolution and networks to your data set. Um, the other difference from, from the gated graph sequence neural network article you described is that uh, your data set is huge. Well, but this is a Hadoop summit. I mean, huge data sets should not be a problem. Well, we, we need to do hundreds of iterations during training. And uh, each iteration, uh, during each iteration, we do several graph convolutions. And uh, each convolution means a shuffle over the entire data set in Spark. Um, Spark may be the most efficient way to do these shuffles, but, but it's always more efficient not to do these shuffles. Well, I, I do love avoiding shuffles. Moving data from all the machines in the cluster to all the other machines is uh, always a bottleneck in my, my algorithms. So how can we avoid shuffles this time? Um, we can take a small snowball sample, a well-connected subgraph that fits on a single machine. Then we can train on that machine without expensive communication with all the other machines. Ah, sorry, I, I don't deal with small data sets. Uh, I have a big cluster of machines to keep busy, you know. You can still keep them busy by letting each of them work on a different sample. Then you periodically merge the trained parameters. And uh, for calculating the final predictions, we can afford to do the spark shuffle, since it happens only once at the end. 
Uh, this sounds very much like the, the Jeff Dean uh, parallelization fr that was mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, I bet it hurts accuracy though, does it? Uh, it depends. <coughs> if you have a hard problem and spend little time and money on computation, use small samples and few machines, then accuracy will be much lower than it would be if you could fit the whole problem on one machine. But if your problem is easier and can be learned from a small sample, then accuracy will be almost the same. Or if you use uh, large machines and train on large samples, again, accuracy will be good. And uh, training parallel on more samples will also increase accuracy. Hmm. Uh, I have uh, an on-premise cluster with a fixed uh, hardware setup, so I don't have any flexibility in that. But it's, it's nice to know that uh, Linkskite will make the most of the, the available resources. And do you remember the... We did an experiment for this where on a single machine the accuracy was 82%. How much yeah, did you I get? I think it, it was 81 or 82, so oh, somewhere. So it gets so super it's close. almost the same. Yeah. I see. Um, uh, thanks for explaining. Do, do you want to say a few words about our implementation? Why not? Uh, we will we will keep the implementation uh, the source code to ourselves. Uh, sorry, but but we will publish a scientific article, you know, with with uh, much more details and stuff, so it can be reproduced. Uh, to talk about the implementation for, for research, we, we first built our own uh, uh, prototype in, in Scala with Spark. Uh, but later we switched to the excellent TensorFlow library from Google. And, and it was a significant speed up, I have to admit. Uh, in, in TensorFlow, the adjacency matrix for the graph, it can be, re it can be represented as a uh, sparse tensor, which is very fitting for this problem. And, uh, and for distributed computation, we use Spark. And uh, as, as we are looking to marry uh, the, the TensorFlow code with the, the Spark code, it uh, looks like we are going to use tensor frames probably, although we, there are so many candidates for distributed deep learning, it's crazy. Uh, okay, so after we've done uh, all that, uh, Will there be any more interesting problems left to solve? Um, maybe. <laughs> one, one exciting part of the algorithm is how the, the neighbor's state vectors are uh, merged as to, to be one, one input for, for, the, for each vertex. Um, we, we need to handle a, a variable length input here, so ju just like a sentence translation. But unlike words in a sentence, uh, the, the ordering of the, of the inputs here uh, doesn't matter. Um, in fact, we want the model to be insensitive uh, to, to the ordering. Um. Yeah, so, th so I guess that's why we cannot use another, uh, just plug in another recurrent neural network here to, to uh, merge those inputs into one. But, uh, so, so what can we do then? Uh, in the current model, uh, we just uh, take the, the, the sum of the, the vectors that obviously uh, has the property that it's uh, insensitive to ordering, but it's not, well, it's not uh, very, very general. I mean, it, so the network has no chance to, to get the maximum or minimum or so, uh, and other stuff from, from the neighbor states. Um, one uh, um, approach we are researching is, uh, is that we, we um, order the vectors according to a metric. And uh, if we, we do this ordering, then, then we can use um, uh, a recurrent neural network or, mm. or something that, that, that isn't insensitive to the ordering because this way the ordering is it just just noise or yeah, isn't just noise. Um, so we 
we, we, we want to try two uh, approaches. One is this, uh, that we put a recurrent neural network for, for every convolution. Um, and another is that we use hyper networks to, to, so we put another network and then another hyper network that, le that uh, learns the parameter for, for, uh, for this network. Ah, I see. I, I cannot wait to, uh, for this work to be finished uh, because it will be very handy for my new application. What application is that? Uh, I want to use this neural network uh, approach for f finding patterns in graphs. Like, uh, imagine that you have, uh, you have a large graph data set and you have labeled uh, a few examples. Uh, maybe maybe it's, uh, uh, the graph describes some relationships between insurance agents and uh, vehicles and uh, car mechanics and such. And, and then we have some labeled examples of insurance fraud. So some pattern in the graph. And uh, we, we want to find uh, more patterns that are not labeled. Or, or another perhaps simpler example is that uh, we have a phone call graph between lots of subscribers, and uh, we have labeled some families. We know that this, this bunch of people here is a family, and then we want, to, uh, we want the neural network to automatically find more such families. Um, have you used the Neo4j or uh, uh, graph frames for, for uh, specifying patterns? Uh, they, these, these programs have a, a pattern description language where you can, like, uh, uh, it has a fairly quirky syntax. Uh, but but uh, the point is that these uh, uh, pattern specifications, they are very specific and they are easy for computers to work with. So it's it, it looks at some vertices and it's able to decide, is, does this match the pattern or not? That, that was specified by the, the human, the analyst. Uh, but but as, uh, as these languages become more and more, more, and more expressive so that they can express uh, uh, very complex patterns, it also becomes harder to master them. Uh, and uh, Right, ma harder to master for humans. The, the computer will still have an advantage there. But, but if we could uh, use just examples to specify patterns, so we wouldn't need to write out a complex uh, pattern specification in one of these languages, but we could just show a bunch of examples and then the computer understands. Uh, then one thing is that it would be infinitely expressive because there's nothing uh, we cannot express this way because maybe we need more examples, but, uh, but there's no inherent limit in this uh, approach and at the same time it's uh, very very convenient to use for the humans that sounds like a like a powerful tool uh, i see some problems we um, we need to solve to to get there uh, one is that it, it seems like we, we will have uh, um, only a few uh, positive labels or or well we, we will only have positive labels and only a few of them how, how can we uh, teach the model without positive labels? Yeah, it's uh, all early stages, but uh, the first thing we'll try is uh, just assume that all the unlabeled pro uh, points, uh, vertices, they are all uh, counter examples, or all weak counter examples. So hopefully we can find a balance there because most of the, almost all of those unlabeled points will, will have to be counter examples just statistically, right? Okay. Um, another problem I see is, is uh, that the network will, will uh, have to uh, identify whole patterns. So not, not, not just individual scoring for, for the vertices. For example, you, you, you can't uh, say that uh, this profile uh, corresponds to a mother if you haven't, um, uh, haven't found any of her child. Um, All right. How would you solve that? Yeah, uh, the plan is that um, if, if, if we can score edges instead of vertices, uh, that brings us a step closer to this because the edge at least has two endpoints, right? So it's not floating there alone. Uh, 
and, and for for many use cases, this this is already a, a full solution. Like this is enough for um, many simple patterns. And um, in other cases, it it's uh, a step forward anyway. And and scoring edges is uh, is just useful for other applications as well. Um, we will also have to solve uh, some new scaling challenges with this problem, but uh, but it should be fine with uh, Apache Spark and all the other cool technologies we heard about today. And yesterday. And uh, yesterday. Uh, those were great as well. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um. Do you have questions? Yeah. Ah, there's one there. Um. Ah, okay, thank you. <coughs> Thanks. Okay, um, I have a question about one of your examples you were talking about. So you were talking about the, um, the prediction of the shortest pass with or without the network itself. So the shortest pass is a uh, property of the network itself. As soon as you include the network itself, then you get, of course, 100% accuracy. Or did I misunderstood anything in this example? So you were saying it goes up from 10% accuracy to 100% accuracy. So could you comment on that? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, uh, I was probably very unclear there. Uh, so in that case, the, the baseline method is, uh, so we were for, for the, our, uh, our own application, we also compared against some baselines, but, but in our own case, the, the baselines were uh, approaches that ignored the edges or something like that in most of the cases. But in, in, in that paper, uh, the baselines, they do not ignore the, the edges. In, in that case, I think the baseline is, uh, is just instead of uh, their own uh, very fancy recurrent neural network, they compare against an LSTM, I think. Uh, I can probably check it out very quickly if you're interested. But I, I recommend that article anyway. It's, uh, it's very good, uh, short. OK, thanks. Right, I, I can go back. So if you're interested in, yeah, that one. Okay, if, if there are no questions, and we still have a lot of time, uh, we have a short video about this same thing. Uh, yeah, you're not escaping this. Uh, oh. I wonder. Mm. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know how to make sound, so maybe. But if you can think of any questions in the meanwhile, uh, <laughs> do I have to plug? <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, thanks. Well, it has roughly the same content as the as our presentation. <laughs> Just, <laughs> more compressed and uh, better animations. Neural networks are a powerful tool for understanding and predicting behavior. Graphs are data sets enriched with connections. Let's take a look at how they can complement each other. 
Neural networks are machine learning models built up of neurons. A single layer of neurons can learn very simple things. Multiple layers can learn complex things. The most complex architectures can learn things that are challenging for humans. Neural networks power tools that are used by hundreds of millions of people every day, including Google Translate and many more. Graphs are interconnected networks. A city is a graph of roads. The internet is a graph of computers. Social networks are graphs of people. Computers are great at processing sequential data. Graphs are hard for computers. Graphs are hard for neural networks. So is it possible for neural networks and graphs to join forces? A neural network can look at one person in a graph at a time. This is Jim, a wannabe rock star. Could Jim be a rock star in 2020? Jim is a decent guitarist, but by no means one of the best. A neural network looking at him in isolation will never bet on him. So when the neural network has to make a prediction, it gives the best answer based on the information on Jim. But the neural network ignored all the connections Jim has. And often, the connections make more of a difference than the individual properties. Which is why Lynx Analytics developed a neural network architecture dedicated to understanding graphs. Through graph capabilities integrated with neural networks, Jim is predicted to become a rock star in 2020. The Lynx solution scales to enormous datasets and provides state-of-the-art accuracy. Every individual across the globe is connected to others through various networks. These multiple networks form an interconnected graph of people, devices, and other entities. At Lynx Analytics, we deliver machine learning algorithms, neural networks powered by massive big data graphs. Together, they can help solve complex problems across diverse fields such as telecommunications, banking, smart city, and transport. We are an innovative company with a problem-solving mindset. With big data graph analytics, we combine technology, data, and brains to deliver measurable outcomes for our clients. Contact Lynx Analytics today. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Except I, I, I just missed that because at the beginning when you were talking about accuracy, but this is uh, when you're guessing a person's age, it's a regression problem. So what's the accuracy in this case? Uh, yeah. There's a presentation. Uh, it's a graph DB on uh, Hadoop. Mm -hmm. Did you, do you have anything to do with that? Oh, no. no. So it's, it's just the, the number of correct answers divided by the the, the all, all the questions. Oh, so it's how many times so you guess the correct age to the year? Uh, no, no, no. It's they are everybody is the age is bucketed into four buckets. So it's just uh, so it's a classification problem. And it's just is it uh, correctly classified or not? And uh, just uh, only measured on the test data that was never used in training. Yeah. Okay. So.